Dr. Chan, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. First, uh, let me thank you uh, for organizing this very important meeting. Uh, the Ebola epidemic ravaging parts of West Africa represents the case of an old disease in a new context that allowed the disease to spread undetected for three months and take off in an unprecedented manner. The question is, of course, then, what are the contextual factors allowing the epidemic to get out of control? Let us you know, remember, West Africa, this is the first time for them to encounter the Ebola outbreak. No doctor in West Africa had ever managed a patient. No laboratory had ever handled a diagnostic specimen. No government had the experience to understand what a disease like Ebola could do to a country's future. The three hardest hit countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, are among the poorest in the world. Borders are porous and population mobility is high as people move around looking for work. Movement of Ebola patients across borders in their quest to find treatment beds has ignited further chains of transmission and flare ups in areas that were approaching control. Community resistance has been a problem, leading to hidden cases and secret burials. Riots by angry community and strikes by healthcare workers and burial teams have further disrupted control efforts. Public health infrastructures in all three countries were damaged or destroyed during years of civil war and unrest. The three countries had only one to two doctors to serve a population of nearly 100,000. That number is now even smaller as nearly 600 doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers have been infected and more than half of them have died. Ladies and gentlemen, prior to the epidemic, these countries are making very good progress, very good progress in development and in health. The outbreak, the Ebola outbreak, is the largest, longest, most severe, and most complex Ebola epidemic in the nearly 40-year history of this disease. What began as a health crisis has become a crisis with humanitarian, social, economic, and security implications. Travel and trade bans have been imposed. Markets are not functioning. Fields are fallow. Ebola, the fear for Ebola, is moving faster than the virus. All these factors are imposing more burden to these hardest hit countries. The Ebola virus, ladies and gentlemen, is an unforgiving virus. Guinea had experienced the first outbreak and Guinea had made good progress at the beginning. And then the disease came back. Cases in Liberia now, the most severely affected country, is coming down. We thank Liberia for the community and the government for making all the good efforts and good progress, but we must not be complacent. As I said, this is an unforgiving virus because the virus now has moved from large cities into remote rural areas. What about Sierra Leone? As you have heard, cases there continue to increase, especially in the northern and western part and in Freetown. Development partners and UN agencies are scaling up action to support the government. Ladies and gentlemen, cyclical pattern of apparent control followed by intense transmission will almost certainly continue 
As long as communities refuse to cooperate with the government and with response teams, families continue to hide cases and refuse safe burials, and the public continues to look at Ebola treatment center as places of contagion and almost certain death. But there are some bright spots, like the swift and very successful control in Senegal and in Nigeria, and now in the case of Mali. Mali is very determined to contain the onward transmission to very few numbers. We should, and we congratulate them for their hard efforts, and we need to maintain our vigilance. Now, another bright spot, and it's the unprecedented support by the international community, non-governmental organizations, and of course, the UNMEA, as referred to uh, by many of you, WHO is providing the technical know-how to stop the transmission and adapting new strategies as the outbreaks evolve. And working with many UN partners and, of course, the special envoy, Dr. David Nabarro, let me, you know, mention a few where they are making extremely important contribution. The World Food Program is not only delivering food, but also other supplies to meet the daily needs and also their logistic capacities. The World Bank has contributed millions of dollars to support these strategic operations. UNICEF has undertaken massive social mobilization campaigns, among other activities, and these campaigns are important at changing the traditional behavior of unsafe burial practices. The vast majority of safe burials are now undertaken by Red Cross and Red Crescent volunteers. And of course, we should not forget the very important contribution made by MSF and other NGOs. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let us you know, remember the comments from Sierra Leone Minister. Ebola crisis can become an opportunity for these governments to rebuild and to strengthen their basic public health infrastructures and health systems, including the international health regulation capacities to detect and respond to outbreaks and other health challenges, as mentioned by France just now. Resilient health system is very important to withstand the shocks that our 21st century world is delivering with ever greater frequency and force. These can be shocks from a killer virus like Ebola or shocks from a changing climate. Ladies and gentlemen, let me end on a very positive note. One year ago, the message about Ebola was very grim. This is a deadly and dreaded disease with no vaccine, no treatment, and no cure. Thanks to the efforts of scientists and industry, this is no longer entirely true. Efforts to fast track research and development of Ebola vaccines are racing ahead. Clinical trials are underway and the results look promising. WHO, working with experts and scientists from around the world, has prioritized a number of experimental therapies including some potential cures, which are also undergoing under clinical trials. Most experts are convinced that this will not be Africa's last Ebola outbreak. At least 22 African countries in the continent have the ecological conditions, the wildlife species, and the hunting practices that favor a return of Ebola at some time in the future. In our view, do we, do we again have problems with uh, the sound to Geneva? Dr. Chan, we cannot hear you.
it's kind of sad that we cannot link up with Geneva and uh, have problems, uh, and uh, especially the intervention by Dr. Chan was very interesting. Can we hear you now, Dr. Chan, again? Yes, uh, can you hear me, Mr. President? Yes. Thank you. Uh, actually, I'm coming to the end. And I said, you know, in our collective view, the experiences today will leave the world much better prepared to respond to such an event. But we need the countries themselves, especially also the support of development partners to invest in building health systems based on primary health care, including very strong community health services. And I'm happy to see our good friend, Dr. Paul Farmer, is in the audience. He will be moderating the next session. He is the best person to talk about health system rebuilding, especially through very strong community services. Mr. President, I want to thank you and all the member states and representatives. And I apologize uh, for the interruption uh, due to technology. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Dr. Chan, thank you very much. And uh, through you, I would like also to thank uh, WHO uh, and all its uh, colleagues, collaborators, uh, for also really assisting in the fight against Ebola. Uh, and I also want to thank you for your personal uh, dedication. And 